All righty, so we're we're at eight thirty, and uh, are we good back there technically, everyone? All right. So good morning to you all. Um, I am Britt Anderson, and we'll be giving some uh, short introductions to the four of us who are doing your presentations today. And uh, I'll show you the I'll show you the schedule. It's kind of a gradual unfolding. I'll give you a couple of different uh, orientations. But first one is that this is the room where we're doing this. So this is the room, hopefully, that you want to be in, or you will. Yeah, I guess now is when you can sort of do your slow sneak away if you're not. Um, I am really, really happy to be here and have the chance to share this with you. I, I think if there's only two or three people that sort of come away with a new infatuation for category theory, that will be a great success. I think it has huge potential to do many beneficial things for sort of our field, broadly speaking. And, and it's just not well known. And I think there are barriers to entry that have to do a lot with terminology and its historical, um, well, it began as an area of mathematics. And so there's just a lot of terminology that if you don't come from that direction can be an impediment to even understanding what the heck it is. So the way things are going to work is because we are a hybrid uh, setting. We have both online and in the room components. It makes it challenging, but we're doing our best to try to create more of an integrated experience. And so I've asked our technical online moderator when he hears the chats to just speak up and interrupt. And um, we have two of our presenters online who will do their presentations online, but we can see them in the room. And it will be my, I've told everyone in the room that it's my intention to pick on people from time to time and ask them to speak. And so I will repeat what they say. But for those of you who are sort of monitoring online, you should also expect that um, I will randomly pick out a couple of you at some point in the next hour or so to speak up and say something so that we can strive for a little bit more of a workshop, a little bit more interaction than just six hours of continuing lectures. So this is the current schedule and the first hour is going to be slightly uh, different, but let me sort of walk through what we have here and a little advice to potentially uh, audience members with different backgrounds. So first I'm going through, you know, we're doing the usual procedural details and workshop goals. Then you're gonna hear each of the uh, presenters, faculty members, whatever we want to call them, introduce ourselves, tell you a little bit how we came to category theory. And the main message that you're going to hear um, four different times is that nobody started out as a, like an undergraduate mathematics person that then wanted to study category theory in graduate school. And that's just the route they follow. They, we all came to category theory from some different specialization, to some different professional path. It may have been mathematics, but it wasn't category theory that then led to mathematics. But in most cases, it wasn't even math. For three of us, our training is not mathematics. So you'll get a sense. Uh, hopefully that will sort of support you if you're feeling like, hey, something is kind of interesting here. I'd like to learn more about it, but I'm not a mathematician. You'll realize that that's not a prerequisite to be able to make use or make contributions uh, in the area. I thought that there might be potentially three broad scopes of people who um, who might want to sit in on this workshop. One would be people who had no idea what category theory was at all, but there just weren't that many workshops to choose from. And this was the least um, sort of, uh, you know, least unacceptable option. And so they found themselves here with no knowledge of what the heck anything was at all. So those folks need a basic, you know, what's the vocabulary kind of give us uh, an orientation that we can work from. And that's what our sort of from now until that first coffee break, that's what we're doing. And even though it's sort of broken up into a bunch of little pieces there, I'm not sure that we'll respect precisely that time frame. but that's gonna be sort of the first, I guess what I have the first hour sort of from nine to, to 10, give or take is gonna be, let's get the basic vocabulary down. Let's try to think about how it might make contact with cognitive science. So if you're somebody who really kind of feels like, yeah, I know the vocabulary, I'm not, and I know what the words mean, but I don't know much more beyond that. 
then maybe you would want to sort of really tune in kind of following that first break starting around 1030 when Stephen is going to be giving sort of first a lecture that kind of transitions into more of the application that gets a little more meaty in trying to talk about how the categorical the category theory terminology and concepts make contact with uh, the domain of cognitive science uh, analogies in particular is the is the anchor point that he's going to do that and then he's going to lead into for his sort of his second talk and the reason he's front loaded is because he's in Japan which is 13 hours ahead of us so he'll be giving his second talk at about one in the morning his time or something um, is uh, it's going to be more of sort of a case study. So this is something like if you feel like, yeah, I kind of have the basics. And in fact, I've worked through some elementary textbooks. So I feel like I kind of know stuff. The case study is where you'll get your most benefit because this will be like, let's actually use it. Let's use it in a way that's research and can get published. And then that's the transition also into the sort of the, after the lunch break. Toby is going to sort of, again, give another kind of, um, I guess, sort of a medium level talk when he does his generalizations and hierarchies to then set up the um, the case studies and one of which is presented by Jeff who's sitting over here and is our other sort of on-site uh, attendee and if you find something interesting here Jeff's around also as well for the next couple of days and so if you see one of us around the conference and you want to follow up or ask more questions um, please do and then Toby will be back with his sort of his more detailed, like his research presentation. So if you know nothing, definitely this first hour is for you. If you feel like you know a little and you don't really need another basic vocabulary overview, after the first break is where things will start getting into sort of the intermediate level and transition. And then following that, when you get to the case studies of the people that even if you know category theory, this would be stuff where you would learn something and it would be useful for you. Okay. So that's the orientation of how things are gonna work and the timing and the difficulties and the levels. Do we have anybody in the online community who's raising a question or has a comment or an issue on this? Not for now. Okay, good. So let's go on to the, to the next slide, which is the workshop and its goals. And, oh, let me um, just for, whoops, that's my pointer. How do I go back? There we go. I did uh, put this schedule in a GitHub repo. So if you want to see the schedule online, you can. The slides I'm going to show you are there. Jeff's slides are there. Um, it's a question of whether we can get Toby's and, um, and Steve's there. But at the moment, they're not. But at least if you want to sort of find some stuff related to what we're talking about today, some of the material will be on this. Uh, so using my name and then a pretty self-explanatory repo. Okay, so this is the goal. We want to go from basic terminology to contemporary research. We're going to give you the stories how we came to it, the basics, and we're going to demonstrate its use. I want you to know what the terms mean. So you could read a, an introductory article and you could then skip the... So if you read an article on category theory and cognitive neuroscience, you'll find like the first three pages are what is category theory. So it'd be nice if you could skip that part and just say like, what are they actually talking about? Um, you will see it used in contemporary research. We're going to get all the way from sort of zero to um, in the one more in the one day, but you're obviously not going to be able to use category theory yourself. Well, I guess maybe the exceptional one of you may be able to do it, but most of us would not be able to use category theory in a professional way after this one workshop. But hopefully, you would know enough to know it was worth your time. It was worth learning more. What it was about. What its potential benefits were. Those sorts of things. Um, and then sort of more detailed, uh, more detailed goals and ambitions that are there. And I think kind of self-explanatory. Okay, so that's the broad overview, how the timing is going to work um, here in the, in the room. The only person's name I saw on a tag that I remembered was Oscars. Oscars, got a question? No. So I told everyone else who was here a little earlier that, yes, I would be making my effort to pick on people and talk to people so there will be less anonymity so you are forewarned all right how about it online do we have anybody wanting anything clarified over there nope nobody no no up in the chat that's great yeah super so and what is your name laura oh you had to look at the tag that was okay good thanks laura so what is it what's that's your name okay so okay. 
Okay, so Laura in the room is asking, what are the mathematical prerequisites? And um, I'm going to ask Jeff to, uh, or others to jump in. I would say there really aren't a lot of prerequisites in the sense that, oh, well, you have to take calculus one before you could take calculus two. It, it's definitely you, there, a certain degree of logical thinking. There's a lot of vocabulary. So knowing math would help you understand the examples that people would illustrate. But you'll hear some category theorists tell you that like the proofs aren't difficult in category theory once you really get it, because there's often only one way to do things or one way to show things. So you're often changing your point of view about the topic more than you are going and accumulating tons of background knowledge. So your professional knowledge, like I know this area of cognitive science really well, um, combined with this understanding of how to conceptualize things can be very fruitful. But what would you sort of now, you're kind of teach a class, what are you gonna tell them the prerequisites are for a intro to category theory course? I'm asking, uh, for those of you online, I'm asking Jeff, uh, uh, Crutwell are one of our present physical present uh, speakers. Should I come with the mic? Or? Sure, feel yeah, definitely. And then Steve and Toby online, if you guys want to chime in, I suggest that uh, what the prerequisites should be just. Yeah, I guess I guess we're hoping that you shouldn't need very many mathematical prerequisites. Um, I think knowing functions, I guess, is really helpful. Um, just what a function is. Um, the, the more mathematics you know, the more you see examples of categories, and that's that's helpful. But I think we're sort of aiming this for as general an audience as possible, and we'll see how it goes. You know, if you have questions as we go along, for sure, ask and things. I think there's some applied category theory textbooks now, which is good. A lot of the before there used to be just sort of. Uh, category theory textbooks written for mathematicians, but there are a few now textbooks if you look up applied category theory. There's a couple textbooks out there sort of for um, more applied domains basically right now. So that's a good entry point, I think. Can I just jump in and say a couple of words? I don't know if you can hear me. Jump in, Toby. Okay, yeah. So I would say there are very, from my perspective, the category theory itself, there are very, very few kind of mathematical prerequisites. It's really kind of a very, very conceptual framework for thinking about things that can be built up out of parts. And it, it turns out that this kind of way of thinking compositionally is really, really, you know, prevalent. Um, maybe it's because of how our you know, minds are wired together that we think this way. But because of this, it's really just about, you know, being able to say clearly what we mean and what the components of things are and how they fit together. Um, uh, I mean, there are going to be some mathematical bits in our talks, but I mean, those are kind of independent, I guess, from the kind of basic, basic kind of notions of category theory itself. It's really about sort of conceptual clarity. And one of the things I think is great about category theory is that it kind of supplies a lingua franca for sort of scientific and mathematical thinking. Okay. So um, maybe some more of that will come up in the sort of the introductions when you hear how, but people people did. Uh, other, before we get into sort of giving the personal introductions about each of us and how we got here, um, I'm looking at the screen to see if there's like online hands popping up and I don't see them. And in the room, I don't see any more hands. Oh. Yeah, so is that something we should uh, handle now here? It's, somebody's pointing out we have a chat or some chat comments, but we can't see what's in them in the room. So just as you read those, chime in if uh, we need to see something. Oh, so we've got some links and things pointed out there. Okay. Can online participants see any slides? I, yes, it looks like that's okay. All righty. So now back to our slides here so that I can, I just have, I think I'm the only one who has any slides on the roots to category theory, but we'll all, um, I'm trying to keep us to just a few minutes a piece. So that's why I actually wrote notes so that I wouldn't digress. So I came, so my background originally is behavioral neurology, is board certified neurologist at a medical school doing that and uh, mostly working with attention and Alzheimer's disease. I went back and got a PhD afterwards and actually did uh, electrophysiology on awake behaving primates for my PhD work. 
And then I moved to the University of Waterloo, where I'm in the cognitive neuroscience area and affiliated with the University of Waterloo, which is in Ontario, Canada, their center, which an hour from here. Um, it still took me longer to get from here than I think probably for some of you to fly. So I drove up in Toronto traffic last night. Um, and then, so I'm at this also affiliated with the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience. So as like a lot of you, you know, you do coding in your your work. And at one era, I was using MATLAB, which I didn't particularly enjoy. And so I started thinking like, well, what other programming languages are out there that might be more expressive for um, sort of mathematical ideas or modeling. And I started looking around and I found this language called Pascal, which since I don't know how well things will project in online, I'll read this. So this is a, a quote from a, a blog. Um, so in 1990, a committee formed by Simon Peyton Jones, Paul Hudak, Phil Wadler, Aston Kutcher, and the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals created Haskell, a pure non-strict functional language. Haskell gets some resistance due to the complexity of using monads to control side effects. Wadler tries to appease critics by explaining that a monad is a monoid in the category of endofunctors. What's the problem? So this is a tongue-in-cheek thing, but actually monads exist in the Haskell programming language. And in fact, a monad is a monoid in the category of endofunctors. And that quote actually doesn't come from Philip Wadler. It comes from, I think, either Eilenberg or the... Uh, there is an early category theory book in which that quote is there. So that sort of, that is category theory jargon. It's used to um, um, clarify or obfuscate. And so Haskell has this big category theory sort of background to it. And so just out of curiosity, I said, well, what is this category theory stuff? And I came across the book on the left, Arrow Stru Structures and Functors, written by Michael R. Beeb in the 70s. Now, Michael R. Beeb was to me known as a computational neuroscientist because he wrote this book or he edited this book on the right, which in the pre-World Wide Web day was sort of the Wikipedia of computational neuroscience. So I started wondering what was the connection between these two domains. This one person computer scientist is writing a book on category theory. This language that seems very appealing for mathematical expressions is somehow anchored in category theory ideas. And yet it doesn't seem to be being used in computational neuroscience. This is purposely like this. This is not even all of Wikipedia's entries on cognitive architectures. And it's as small as I could make it to even get it sort of at all potentially identifiable as text. So I am very tired of, in our field, the challenges to understand whether something is new, whether something is different, what's innovative, when are two things conflicting with each other, when we have lots of theories, lots of ideas. And as you heard Toby say, so to me, the idea of category theory as a lingua franca seemed very appealing, that we could have a language of vocabulary that we could use for structuring our discourse about our models, our theories, and our ideas that would make it very clear and transparent what we meant, when things were the same, when things were different, and would maybe help us gain insight into our field. And if you look at mathematics, where category bent theory has been used, that's often it's one of its great strengths historically was, oh, this thing in topology is exactly like, you know, this thing in vector spaces. And in fact, the natural numbers are, are very much the same in some sense as this other complicated thing. And so it's seeing in math how these disparate areas were sort of, um, their similarities were understood, that has great appeal to me. So I kept looking for the course that I could take, somebody with a background in neuroscience and psychology and cognition, and I could not find one. Um, so I was a little bit like this character in this XKCD strip who sort of just learned about the theory of relativity and you know now is going to write a blog post to overturn it. And so it's like, well, if there isn't the course that I want to take available, why don't I just organize the workshop that is the course that I wanted to take or I would have wanted to take a few years ago when I was first starting to think about these subjects. So that's my path to category theory. It comes from this neuroscience background, exposure to it in a programming language, and then seeing how it might be used as a powerful vocabulary for um, consistently stating our ideas and our theories so that we could make better comparisons and progress. 
So I thought it would be good to alternate between the two uh, modalities. So I think the next person on the list is Stephen. Stephen, you have about four or five minutes if you want to, to share how you came to category theory. So Mike, I think we'll need to toggle over to the, there we go. So you are oh, visible. Hi. Thanks, Britt. Um, and my background is in uh, computer science and uh, my PhD was in some aspects of connectionism. And about 15 years ago, I, I started to get really interested in category theory, primarily because a lot of the debates in cognitive science, you know, everyone in cognitive science, you know, um, about the, some notion of structure as, as important to understanding cognition. But it's difficult to, it's not always clear whether uh, different people are, are really talking about the same notion of structure. And so often you get these debates in cognitive science that seem to go back and forth without any clear resolution. I think partly that's because um, different cognitive scientists have different intuitive notions of what structure, what, what kind of structure they're, they're talking about. And hence, <clears throat> often they these debates sort of need, uh, don't get resolved or often talking at two different levels. So that sort of motivated me to think more about what, what do we mean when we mean um, structure? Everyone talks about it, but um, different people seem to have different conceptions of the idea. And so um, being, in a, being from a more of a, a sort of a theoretical computer science, from a theoretical computer science department, I thought I had a pretty good handle on the notion of structure. But as it turns out, even the computer scientists had gone through this kind of um, reconciliation. You know. And you know, in, the, in the 70s, I suppose, 70s and 80s, um, category theory had started to impact on the way you know, computer scientists were thinking about the notion of particularly computational structure. So that got me thinking about, oh, well, uh, you know, who knows, um, uh, who has a good handle, or how to get a good handle on this notion of structure. And that, that led me to um, category theory as kind of, in some sense, kind of theory of structure. And, that, and that's when I started really getting interested in the, the idea. At, that, at the time, I didn't have any particular uh, application in mind. I just wanted to get a, sort of a, a better sense of, of notions of structure and um, sort of to echo Toby's point and what Britt has already said. Um, I see one of the usefulness, one of the useful points of category theory is as a kind of landmark. Every, every, you know, there are many models in, in cognitive science. In fact, you know, cognitive science, as you know, cognitive science was set up as a kind of interdisciplinary uh, field. But you know, as we progress, it seems to on the opposite, they're rather more specialized with more and more complicated models uh, addressing more and more detailed um, effects. It gets, harder, it gets harder for even people within the same group you know, um, working more or less on the same kinds of data often find it difficult to communicate to each other what their particular model is doing and how it relates to other models. So I see category theory in, in one sense as a kind of landmark when we talk about concept of structure, that is, um, ever since I really got into category theory, when I hear someone talk about some particular model or some particular effect, or I try to relate it to some sort of category theory construction, which then allows me to sort of um, orient my thinking as to how, what, what that person's model is trying to do. And then from then on, I, as I got learned more, more about it, I got more and more interested in it and started trying to apply it in, in to particular aspects of cognitive science. Okay, so thanks, Steve. Um, can I, can I yeah, I'm trying to, yeah, I'm interrupting basically trying to keep us on time. Is it okay? Did you have a, can I uh, let Jeff do his bit now? Yep, I was, I was just about to say that's, that was my introduction. <laughs> okay, all right, thanks. All right, Jeff. Oh, hi everyone, Jeff Cartwell. I'm at the Mount Allison University in New Brunswick. Um, so I'm actually the one mathematician, um, but when I was an undergrad, actually I was undergrad in Waterloo, though I don't think I ever took a course from Brit, <laughs> I, I flipped the coin to decide between mathematics and philosophy because I really liked them both. And I actually couldn't decide in first year which I wanted to do. And the coin ended up mathematics. So I went into mathematics. I don't know if the coin had gone the other way, maybe I just stayed in it. But uh, as I was taking mathematics mm -hmm. courses, I still took philosophy as well. And in one of my philosophy courses, actually I've learned category theory. I didn't learn in the mathematics course. And it was in particular talking about how um, you could use category theory to talk about the foundations of mathematics. 
And I thought the ideas that they talked about there seemed really elegant and interesting. And so I started pursuing it a bit more and I ended up going to grad school to, to learn more about category theory. And the thing I found too was sort of echoing comments as well, especially in mathematics, was that it, it brings, it allows you to sort of have a common language to talk about different areas. And we see the same thing that people are mentioning in mathematics where um, very, different areas of mathematics have come, ver come very um, separated in a sense. You have topology, you have geometry, you have analysis, and they all speak their own language. And it's hard to see the connections between them. And category theories have provided a language to make those connections and see how something in one area of math is similar to something else. So that's what I've been doing for a long time and really just working in pure mathematics. And recently I started realizing, noticing that there was more and more conferences and workshops and, and things using applied category theory. And I couldn't even see how that would work because to me, it always seemed like a very pure mathematical idea. Um, but it's really become a bigger and bigger thing in the last few years. You see uh, uh, category theory, it's been long used in computer science, but also in physics in um, uh, starting to happen in biology and chemistry and all these other sciences. And it's, it's really interesting to me. It sort of makes sense in some sense um, um, because it has sort of the structure to be able to talk about a variety of different things. Um, so I ended up working with some people and writing a paper on sort of a start of how we could sort of think about category theory ideas in machine learning and, and deep learning and things like that. And I'll talk a little bit about those ideas this afternoon. Um, so this is a whole new world for me. I've always just been sort of in mathematics and sort of branching out a little bit now coming to a co conference like this in cognitive science, which I think is, is really neat to, to make these kind of connections. Thanks. And so the field is very welcoming. If you're sitting here and you're thinking like, well, can I actually talk to one of these folks? Like I, they were all, I didn't know all these people before. They all just uh, were very willing and responded to random emails to come in and do this uh, with you. So Toby, do you want to uh, sort of talk a little yes. bit about your, your path here and uh, in, a, in a couple, three, four minutes? Yes, sure. I'll, tr I'll do my best. Luckily, a lot of people have, um, a lot of you guys have already talked about this kind of, these kind of ideas of lingua franca and the mathematics of structure. It's nice that Jeff mentioned the kind of um, versioning applied category theory world. In fact, it was the, this year's applied category theory conference last week. And um, there were talks all about all sorts of things from sort of ecology to machine learning to dynamical systems to logic. Um, it's, it's, it's really spreading um, in, in, into lots of different fields. But my own particular background um, was actually originally in psychology and philosophy. And I, um, so I'm now doing a PhD, finishing it up in Oxford, in, ostensibly in computational neuroscience, but it's largely turned into a kind of piece of applied category theory. And so I've sort of gone full circle. I started as an undergrad, as an undergraduate, wanting to understand kind of the mind from a sort of computational perspective. And I found that this course was uh, in psychology and philosophy was, was very kind of disjointed and insufficiently rigorous. And subsequently, I, I, I you know, went away and I did a lot of mathematics and Thought about complex systems and return to thinking about the brain but it's still turned out it still seemed to me to be the case that you know there's this thing called computational neuroscience but it doesn't really have a very good notion of computation um, and then there are all these different bits of the literature so I, in principle i was supposed to be studying um, the hippocampus and how brains learn to navigate the world but there's you know there's all this different literature and people with models and they're all very imprecise and they all, as, as um, Jeff was saying about mathematics, they're all, you know, people all have their own language and how to sort of translate between these languages is not at all clear. And I kind of wanted to understand and kind of integrate this literature um, and kind of have a sort of holistic perspective on what it might mean to do kind of mental computation. Um, and I started thinking about I started thinking about this from the perspective of active inference. Um, I'll say a little bit about that later, about this kind of idea that brains might be doing a certain kind of computation. Um, but I was also thinking about things like neural representation and how you know, the compositional structure of language might be encoded into neural activity. Um, and, and all of these things seem to say, OK, well, I need um, some, some language to kind of frame these things compositionally and to talk to, you know, to be able to talk to talk between fields um, and, and it turned out that, that language was category theory and it's kind of proving very productive um, and one thing I want to emphasize now and later is that it it kind of really forces you to think clearly um, because you have to you have to say as we'll see later what are the objects and what are their some relationships and you can't you effectively can't say something unless it's well typed and so it's really good sort of, sort of um, cognitive discipline this kind of language um, 
And before, so before I finish off, I just want to say one more thing, which is that it, because it's all about relationships, it really emphasizes interaction and openness of systems, systems and context. And I think that's really important in the world right now that we think about you know, how things are interconnected. It's a kind of more ecological way of thinking about scientific, uh, sort of mathematics scientifically. Um, it's ra rather than just things on their own, it's kind of the way things behave and how things function, how things are structured, it's all dependent on like, how they're connected to other things. That's, I mean, that's all I'll say for now. I'll say more, I'll say more later. Yeah. Thank, yeah, thanks very much, Toby. That was that was great. So you've heard that you know you people are using it for machine learning, people are using it for systematicity, people are using it for active inference. So we want to get you. So now, hopefully, that we've sort of suggested and implied that there's this payoff down the road, we need to get you started. So the thing that Toby just uh, sort of presaged for us is to have a category. You have to have two things. You have to have the stuff and you have to have the rules. And the first thing we're gonna talk about is the stuff. So what is the stuff of a category? So for the stuff of a category, you have two things. You have the objects and you have the arrows. I'm using the word arrows because to me, it sort of fits more with the box and arrow diagrams that most of us have seen historically and used in a lot of psychological or cognitive models, but you'll often hear this word morphisms um, used perhaps much more commonly than the word arrows. Um, and I wanted to make a mnemonic, so later on I'm going to cheat and use morphisms, but mostly it's object and it's arrows. You can kind of use a little bit of sort of intuition of thinking like your nouns and your verbs, but we've got the things and we have the things that connect the things. So this is my first uh, effort to uh, sort of interrupt the passivity by sort of, uh, and the up the anxiety by like, oh, is he gonna ask me to speak in front of everybody? So let's start with the online people. And while you're thinking about what your category is, I'll give you an example of, can we switch to the, to the Zoom thing? So I'm thinking like, oh, you're a memory researcher. So you do a lot of research where you give people items to, mem to memorize and then later on you ask them to recall them. How could you, what would be a category for that? And so maybe you start thinking like, okay, I've got to have objects and I have arrows. What in my experimental paradigm might be the objects? Well, I guess it could be the words. Okay, so that's, if I make the words the objects, then what are the things that connect the words? Well. I don't know, maybe the whether they're recalled or not recalled. Well, maybe that's okay. Well, how about if I give the word and then the person gives me an association or the other word? I have the list I deliver and the list I they give back to me in the recall phase. So maybe my objects are a list of words that I gave them and a list of words that are recalled. And there could be lots of different responses. So maybe my arrows go from the list I delivered to potential sets of words that they could repeat to me. Oh, okay, so maybe maybe I should think about sets. Maybe I should think about sets of words and arrows are connecting sets of words and somehow that's gonna be the objects and arrows of my memory task. That may or may not be a productive one, but that's what I mean when I'm saying, I wanna try to get you thinking about concretely, like what is it that's your area? How could you even begin to start mapping on terms like objects and arrows to the physically concrete stuff you think about and test? So what are you working on? What can we make objects and arrows? Yeah, what's your name? Salvador, I've asked Salvador here, so I cheated actually. So, but next I'm gonna ask Matias Pink what he's doing, but after Salvador is done. Okay, so reasoning, so Salvador works on reasoning and he's suggesting that uh, the objects could be the mental representations, but we're gonna have to have arrows that connect those. So how would, uh, how would you sort of just off the top of your head think what are sort of the, the connections between mental representations? What would that mean in the context of research? Okay, so the Salvador was suggesting that we could use 
the transformations, rules of inference, maybe sort of try to map uh, arrows onto the rules of inference would be arrows that would connect mental representations, or I guess we could, I'm thinking now just like we could take kind of a dynamic systems approach. We have mental representations going to other mental representations. So we might try to capture the dynamics of a thought process in time or unfolding by some sort of arrow that actually connects back from our category of mental representations to itself. This one of these, maybe that would make it an endofunctor like we heard about. So there's ways we could start thinking about terms. Uh, Matthias, Pink, what, uh, what are you working on? If you're, uh, so we'll, uh, some people may just have their screens on. I'll try another one. Let's see. Or so maybe someone wants to raise their hand and sort so, of make it be a volunteer. Oh, can, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, awesome. Um, doing reinforcement learning. Um, reinforcement learning. Okay. With supervised learning. So it's, it's a bit more abstract, I guess. And may, maybe a category of, of, uh, of the field, field describing what, what I'm doing would, would, would consist of uh, objects of value functions. Uh, actions and, and rewards relating them to, to an environment, perhaps. Okay, so we have reinforcement learning. And so now we want to think about what the objects are of the reinforcement learning and the arrows. And you're suggesting that uh, I want to repeat it because I was just so you're saying we should make the objects the value functions or we should or the value functions are going to be the arrows. Matthias? Uh, I, I actually don't know. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I don't know either. And I think that's also an important point is that there's not just one way to do these mappings. And what I've been told is that often one of the more creative acts of the category theorist is actually deciding or discovering what is the productive mapping from the domain of application that you're interested into the category. And so there is not one canon canonical way that you should treat any particular domain and say, these are and must always be the objects. I mean, maybe over time approach will become recognized as valuable, so it will be more used, but you can definitely turn things on their heads and say like, yes, the things that a lot of people think are the objects, um, maybe make more sense for me to think of as the arrows. And I don't have a, a non-mathematical example to give you off the top of my head, but one that I like that just is the is the natural numbers, one, two, three, four, five, those sorts of things. Turns out that it can be very productive to think of those as a category in which there's just an object that has no name. It's often you know, represented with an asterisk or a dot or something. And the arrows just connect that dot to itself. And each one of those arrows is the number. So the numbers, <laughs> which we might be biased initially, thinking of like those should be the objects in our category and somehow we're going to connect the numbers. Maybe it makes more sense to not even really worry about the object and just say the numbers are going to be the arrows and we're going to worry about how to get those arrows uh, mapped together. Hey, Britt, yeah. I could, I, I think I could, um, I just, I, I, two things I want to say. Um, one is that's a great example. And in fact, that's uh, an example that shows that you mentioned um, monoids earlier. Um, every monoid is like a category with one object. So if you hear this word monoid, you can just think of natural numbers, like Rich was saying, and then the, the elements of the monoid are the arrows and the monoid multiplication is the composition. But I was thinking about this reinforcement learning example. And I thought one thing you could do is you could have like the states of the state space be the objects and like the probability of transitioning from one state to another given an action be, be the morphism. And then if you, you know, you could jump from one to another and then you could kind of multiply the probabilities. Um, I think I think you could put reinforcement learning into this. Yeah, that's a nice one. Okay, so this is, uh, thank you. Keep jumping in, uh, this will be great. Um, can we go to the, uh, back to the slides for a second, please? So this is what we did. So this is, now this is the rules and um, we just heard the, we just heard sort of the rules um, sort of uh, uh, hinted at here. So I try to come up with mnemonics for things since for some of you, all the vocabulary is new and it's hard to remember. So if you're at all paranoid, you know, we can remember it as the CIA. So we, arrows have to compose. Arrows have uh, their identity arrows for every object. Um, and all the arrows 
um, exhibit associativity. So these are so you you create your category by deciding what the objects are and what the arrows are. And then if you want to make sure that you have a category, you have to make sure that the arrows obey these rules. You can certainly come up with structures that don't follow these rules, but then they are not categories. So it's not that everything has to obey these rules. It's just that if something is a category and you're going to call it a category, it has to obey these rules. So what is composition? Composition is sticking two things together. So they have to be... Um, eligible to be stuck together. And you'll see a lot of diagrams of this ilk if you start looking at books or articles that involve category theories. There is, are other classes of diagrams, but these historically, these sort of commutative diagrams are very uh, commonly um, introduced in, in category theory. And people often reason and prove things actually with the diagrams as opposed to, or at least they can sometimes prove things with a diagram. You could say like, is this thing the same as that thing? And then you can just diagram trace and show like, yep, you can actually get from here to here and it's the same thing. So usually the objects are gonna be represented in this kind of diagram as the nodes and the arrows are gonna be, and the morphisms are gonna be represented by the arrows. And there is a tendency to use a function like, um, uh, notation for the arrows, so like the Fs and the Gs and the Hs, but that can be a little bit um, biasing. So I would encourage you to not get trapped into thinking that arrows are always functions or need to be functions. There certainly are cases where they are sort of the functions we're used to for math, but they often the more interesting applications are when you break those rules and think more creatively. So here we have three objects connected by three arrows. And the question is, um, do they compose? And there's two different notations for composition. There's this one that uses a semicolon, and there's this one that uses the more traditional function composition operator. So some people like this one because it reminds the top one that's G circle F. I'm looking at the lower, I don't know if the, does, does the online group see the pointer if I shine it? Oh, okay. No, okay, yeah, so... Um, if you look at the lower left of the slide, you have G circle F. That's more of a traditional mathematical notation. The F happens first, not the, so we tend to read left to right. So it's a little bit sometimes disorienting that the G is the first thing you see, but it's the last thing that's being um, used. So that's why some people like the notation on the bottom with the semicolon in between, because that gives you your left to right intuition. First, I do F then I pipe the result to G. So if you're a computer scientist and you do a lot of piping, maybe that one makes more sense, F pipe G. But in both cases, we want those to equal H. If you have any two arrows in your category that connect, like X connects to Y, Y connects to Z, those F and Gs connect. If it's gonna be a category, their composition has to exist in that category. So here I've drawn an arrow H. And there really should be a question mark in the lower left corner there, whether those two composition that, well, it's one composition written two different ways. Does it or doesn't it equal that H? And I think I had one more slide. Nope. Okay. So let me go back. Okay. So if it equals H, then H is the composition of F and G. And if it doesn't equal H, then H is not the composition. And if these are the only arrows and nodes in this category, then it has a big effect. If they don't equal H, then it's not uh, a composition. It's, and so this is not a category. So if it's a category, all the arrows and all of the compatible arrows have a composition and that composition is an arrow in the category. And I'll give you an example of something to think about, try to make this concrete. Which is this one. So a lot of us deal with graphs. Graphs are nodes. Um, and edges. So think of us as having a graph here, A, Bs, those are our nodes and we've got our edges connecting them. Maybe you're, you know, doing a causal dependency graph, some sort of statistical structure. Maybe this is fMRI data and you're trying to figure out which region of the brain is, um, you know, statistically related to some other region of the brain and something you've recorded. And so my question for you is, is this a category? So because you sit close to the front, Brett, I saw your name when I walked over there. So do we have a category here? I think so. Okay. We don't have the, uh, 
we don't have two arrows that can be combined into a third arrow that uh, is called the composition. No composition. So. All right. So, can I induce any uh, any controversy in the room? Does anyone want to oppose Brett's objection to this being a category? Yep. I not only have to draw another arrow between A and D, I have to draw arrows all over the place. Um, any two arrows that connect, I have to connect. So once I've drawn an arrow that connects A and D, now I also have to draw an arrow that connects, you know, since I had a, a dark arrow connecting D to E, I now have two arrows. One goes from A to D and one goes from D to E, and I need to compose those. So I need to compose the arrows that were the compositions of the first round. So I need to keep adding and adding and adding all of the comp compositional arrows um, and make sure that they are there. So a graph is not sort of the, sort of the bare graph is not often a category, but you can turn any graph into a category if you add all these other arrows. So the notion that I'd like to make here is that you have to think whether that makes sense. You could come up with any sort of object category, object arrow, um, cat, you know, uh, structure that you wanted. And you could basically just say like, okay, well, I'm gonna just draw in all the other arrows and assume they're there. But, you sh but if you're doing an applied category theory um, operation, you want to be thinking like, does this make sense for my application? Does this make sense in the circumstance in which I'm using it that I need to add all these other arrows? So that's my, um, my question here at the bottom is, does this make sense in a graph for me to add all these other lines? What would all those other lines be um, if this was to, um, if I was trying to turn every graph into a category in this way? Um, Let's try somebody online. Do we have anybody online who wants to tell us what all those dotted lines are in this graph? It looks like uh, transitivity. Right? If A goes to B and B goes to C, then also A has to go to C. Okay. Um, yep. I don't know I, if I'm I, getting that I, right or not. No, I, I think you're 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 correct in what you're reporting. I just think uh, I was going there. I think there's a technical term in the graph theory world for how people tend to refer to those um, to those dotted lines. And so maybe I'm asking sort of what am I what am I thinking or what I want you to guess my thought. Were you going to suggest something? I've got someone in the room who kind of flinched and now I'm pointing at them. Or if you had to have the H equal to F G. So, and so here um, I mean, here it would be tempting to say that the, the dash line uh, should be the composition of the first two lines from A to B and then B to C. And then you would define the line from A to C as the composition of the first two arrows. Okay. So um, let's go back to the slides for just a second, Mike. All right. So in this, in this setting, I think maybe it would have been easier to sort of uh, prime you for what I wanted you to say if I had put numbers on all these things. So let's think of this now as a graph of... Uh, of how you get around the city. So, you know, if I'm at my hotel, which is A, it takes me, you know, 400 meters to get to the conference center. From the conference center, I can get to the second cup and it's another 100 meters. And then, but I can also get to somewhere else. So each one of these is a distance connecting two nodes in a actual spatial graph. So then in this situation, you'd be looking at the path links. So like, oh, if it takes me 200 meters to get to second cup and 100 meters to then get to the conference center, it should take me 300 meters to get to the conference center. So I can actually make a connection that is the distance from my hotel to the conference center via the route you know, that passes the second cup. So I was just going for the idea that sometimes in graph theory, these people are referred to paths or path lengths as opposed to just the edges. If you compose all the edges into paths, and so now you say my graph has all of the paths, and as we'll see in just a moment, if I say that it's always possible to stay in the same place, and so I call that an identity arrow that has a path length of zero, then you can turn pretty much any graph into a category as long as you add the paths to the actual edges and the notes.
If I say something wrong, you guys should contradict me uh, early. We have some later print. Um, it's important for to know too that in, in a category you have more than one arrow between those two objects. The graph thing, the graph perspective can sometimes make you think that um, you can only have one arrow between two objects, but in category you can have many possible arrows. So what Jeff is saying in the room is he wants to for people to take away the fact that even though every one of my examples has had a single arrow connecting two nodes or two objects, that is absolutely not necessary. You can have multiple nodes or multiple arrows connecting objects. And if you think back to that example of the natural numbers, we only have one object and we have an, a countable number of arrows that are connecting that same object to itself. One, two, three, as high as you can count, or and then some. So, you can also think of it in this graph example too. You can think of many different possible paths from there. Right. You can think of a single path, maybe you can think of many possible. Right. So I'm repeating. For people in the room, may think I'm being kind of. Uh, yeah, for those of you online, that's why I'm repeating what Jeff says, not because for those of you in the room that I disagree or don't think he said it clearly. What he's just emphasizing to those of us in the room is that if you think about this graph example, maybe there's multiple ways for me to get from my hotel to the second cup. One of them is 200 meters. Another one is 400 meters. A different one is 800 meters. So I could have three different arrows from my hotel to the second cup coffee shop. All would be distinct and not the same but I would then have to have compositions of each of those three arrows with whatever second cup connected to. And if there are multiple ways to get from second cup to the convention center, then I could have you know, quite a big combinatoric increase in the number of arrows in my category in order to accommodate all the compositions I have to have if I'm gonna call it a category. Can I just jump in as well quickly, Brett? Yep. It's Toby. Um, I, I don't know if you're gonna, are you gonna oh, wait, say oh, the so, name? <laughs> So wait a second, we got uh, Toby, Jeff said there's a question in the back of the room. Oh, sorry. And then, all of a sudden I heard a, and then I heard a voice that I was completely confused because <laughs> you're coming from behind me. So hold on one second, Toby, I'll let you yep. uh, clarify. But then I had a back of the room question for someone. Yep. Please just shout it out. That's your choice, your category, you're in control your situation, your application. If it's a one-way street and you're modeling it, then no, you can't get back. But if it's in this scenario I've been talking about, you absolutely could get back, but that's a different arrow. That's the arrow from B to A. You would not just think of all the arrows as double-headed. They have a tail and they have a end. They have a domain and they have a co-domain. And each arrow is uniquely defined by its domain well, each arrow has a unique domain and codomain. If those are different, they're different arrows. Your situation may be such that every time it goes in both ways, their labeling or meaning is the same for you, but they're going to be in your category. They're going to be distinct. Toby? Yeah, I was just going to ask, are you going to say the name of this construction? Because people, people might come across something with that name and not know what it means. And I could just... Tell them the name, Toby. Okay, so this, this thing is called, if you get a graph and you turn it into a category without adding any extra constraints like this, it's called forming the free category on the graph. And it's free because of this kind of no constraints thing. And a lot of the time in category theory literature, you get the free something or other. And this, this freeness always comes up in the same kind of way. It's like you just get the thing and you turn it into the, the other kind of thing, in this case, a category in the kind of simplest way possible. Um, and so, yeah, this free category on a graph thing, it just has the, the, the nodes of the graph and the paths between the nodes as the morphism. All right. That's good. Thank, thank you. And uh, the other half of that, you can also have forgetful categories where you, for, you say there's some structure that you just don't need to worry about. Yes, if you forget the category structure, you get a graph back. Yeah. So we could, you can have a free and a forgetful construction. All right, is there more coming from the online folks? Okay, yeah. more in the room, yep. We have a, a question oh, okay, online. Please. Okay, so I'll take one Sorry. from online and then I'll come back to you in the room. So we'll alternate here. So what's our online question? Well, online we have Zachary Dubek asking, 
Back to the real-life example, some states will not be accessible for certain states. Would that still be a category? Does an arrow with transitional probability of zero make sense? Oh, reinforcement learning, not real-life example, sorry. Back to the reinforcement uh, learning example. Some states will not be accessible from certain states. Would that still be a category? Does an arrow with transitional probability of zero make sense? You can, so I was gonna show an example of this later, but the most sort of disconnected category you can have is a discrete category in which each object exists by itself and it has its identity arrow and none of the objects talk to any of the other objects. And that is called a discrete category. And it is a um, sort of a simple or maybe a base case in some way because you don't have any other of the complexity of these connections. So you can certainly have objects that are disconnected from all of the other objects. You do not need to have any structure. It may not be a very interesting category, but it's a permissible category in terms of permissible, in terms of the, the axioms of category theory. It may not be a very interesting category. It may not match your um, your scenario. Um, in a reinforcement learning, you might, I guess, maybe there's some sort of an absorbing state. So you might have an object that has arrows going into it, but never any that come out of it. Um, if it makes sense for you to think that there are certain states that if you start in them, you can never ex exit them. So you might want to have a, a state in your uh, as an object in your category that was disconnected from all the others. That would be permissible from the category theory uh, requirements. But so hopefully you're hearing a theme that you are sort of free to choose. So there's some there's some categories that are sort of mathematically well known and described, and they have certain requirements. If you want to say that you're studying your area as an example of one of those, then you're stuck with the way they work. But if you want to take it from the other end and you want to say like, well, I'm just thinking about what I do and I want to sort of start building up my own intuition and how I might construct a category from what I'm interested in, then if it makes sense for you to have one disconnected object, you get to have one disconnected object. Okay, so there was a question back there. Yep. So let's say we have two objects that um, have two arrows going back and forth. So the situation described before, then by the principle of compositionality, should there be some sort of an um, So hold that thought for one second, and can uh, can I have the slides again? All right. So something like this, where I've got dog and cat and bird, and dog and cat are connected by two arrows going back and forth. Yeah. I have two numbers, and so what is can, so you can so we all can be on the same page here. What's the uh, can you repeat the question for me so I can repeat it for the online folks? Right. So my question is, if I have only dog and cat and I have arrows three and four, then should there be an automorphism um, for dog, uh, on dog? Uh, why not cat? Because if you, oh yeah, it's on cat as well. Yeah. So if I want, so it is, so let's, um, so I know I've got another question in the room. I'm going to come back to it. So don't let me forget, but let me try to finish this thought here. So everything has to have an identity I mentioned. So we heard the term automorphism. So this arrow connects its object to itself. X is the only object here. There's one arrow that connects X to itself. I'm notating it as ID for identity with a little teeny X because each object has its own identity arrow. There's not one identity arrow for all of the objects. Each object has its own um, unique, okay, maybe not, it has its own arrow. Um, and so you'll see that notation often. They are typically not drawn um, because they clutter the illustrations and Many times they're not interesting to the particular application or proof that's being made, although they certainly can be. And so for that reason, just diagrammatically, they're often not depicted because they're understood to be there that you just know everybody has them. So in this picture that I was showing a moment ago, there is an identity arrow on dog and cat and bird. 
And if these are the only arrows that are there, then the composition of the dog and cat arrow, the four and the three, or the three and the four, has to equal the identity arrow. So I drew the identity arrow for cat here, and the composition of four and three has to equal that identity arrow. Now, whether it does or it doesn't depends on what you think the identity arrow is and what composition is, which we haven't said what composition is here. If you think of it as addition, then it's clearly going to be a problem because I'm going to have four plus three equals seven and three plus four equals seven. So I'm going to need to have sevens on both of those ends. And so, you know, you can build things that don't work, but you are right in the general idea. If you two arrows go back and forth, there must be an arrow that represents their composition. If it's not the identity arrow, it should be drawn in. So if somebody thought there was an additional arrow connecting cat to itself and dog to itself, that was not the identity arrow, they would have drawn it in the diagram and they would have had to make it explicit because the understanding would be without an extra arrow being drawn, you're just only got the identity arrow available to you. Did that answer your question? Okay, and then I had a question up here and then I'm coming back to you, but I got one up here first. So much for the last question. So you said earlier that each arrow has a unique domain importance. You also said that you could have two different arrows same object, same object. Yeah. I, I guess maybe, maybe we're just... So I think the, the intuition we offered for that was from the graph, um, the graph model. So I may go from here directly to my hotel and it has a distance of 300 meters. But I might, I might say like, oh, can I connect with the walkway? So somehow I go up and I find this tower and this walkway and it takes me 800 meters. So both of those are arrows going from A to be so the arrow itself has can be mapped to a domain and a codomain and this other arrow which is a longer way for me to get back to my hotel still has the same domain started here at the convention center and the same codomain and a unique codomain ended up at my hotel but they're two different routes so they have two different distances they're two different arrows does that clear yeah, just some of the use of unique okay so and maybe maybe i yeah so each arrow has a domain and only one domain. Yeah. Um, so taking your example of, of sort of walking distances, but applying it to this graph, if we imagine dog and cat to be locations, so it takes three steps to get from cat to dog and four to get from dog to cat. In that case, the composition would not be a, the identity arrow, right? It, it, it would be walking seven steps rather than not moving at all. So I guess my question is, in a case like that, are you also required to include not only the composition, but sort of the implied infinite number of possible compositions? That is, you might go from cat to dog, back to cat, back to dog, back to cat. Do you also need to include that and also include the results of doing it three and four and as many times as you wish? Does each of those need to be an arrow that, that is explicitly drawn? Well, but they, they, they do, but they go away. So this identity arrow is defined based on its effects on other arrows. So another, um, maybe it's a maxim of category theory is the interesting stuff is the arrows. I think a lot of us come with a bias that it's the stuff that we're interested in, the things that are really important to us. But if you start trying to change to this category theory approach to things, you're gonna start trying to emphasize the connections between the things more than what the things are themselves. And so I've got a few other bits of vocabulary that I'm not going to mention, but there's like epimorphisms and monomorphisms. And then the big important one is isomorphisms um, that you may know from other mathematical contexts. So these morphisms, but they're defined sort of how arrows affect other arrows and whether arrows equal or whether compositions are equal. So in the case of the identity arrow with these two objects, X and Y, if I apply IDX first, and then apply F, it's the same as applying F by itself. If I apply F first and then apply the identity of Y, it's the same as F itself. So the identities there kind of disappear. So now substitute identity X a second time. Identity X composed with identity X is gonna be identity X. So then if you actually had 
47 identity X's, the first two are going to become one identity X. And then the next one's going to collapse into it. And so your 47 identity X's are just going to be identity X. So you don't have to actually draw Can I add infinite. Oh, so yes, go ahead, Toby. That's Toby, uh, right? Yeah, so I just wanted to add, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to add, so in the case, I didn't get to the name of the person who asked, asked the question, but about adding these, like yeah, what's the name? What's all these extra composites. So if you have like F, Gabriel. Okay, thanks, Gabriel. So the I think. Okay, David, well, <laughs> sorry. Hey, also, no, I, I missed it. I messed <laughs> you up, Toby. So anyway, you can just re refer to a, a uh, yeah. Uh, refer <laughs> to a person who asked a question. Okay. That'll be easier. Um, yes. Okay. So if you have like x so we have this picture it's like i don't know like cat and dog or x and y or whatever and you drew like f from x to y and then like g from y to x then yeah you have to have f and then you have g and then you have f then g then f then g so they're all those are all morphisms um, and they're in the category but in this case the kind of the picture we drew just had f and g and you don't actually always need to draw all of the other morphisms because um, they're somehow like generated just by these 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 morphisms, these arrows in the picture, um, and so this is like the thing I mentioned about the free category. You say it's like generated by this graph, and so the kind of the basic stuff you care about is this picture. Um, but you don't need to draw all of the other morphisms. You just need to kind of bear in mind that they exist. They're in the category structure, but they're kind of not like extra things. They're kind of they're kind of they're just generated by applying the rules of the category structure, just having these composites. So you don't, you don't need to have them in the picture, but you have to have them in your head. Yeah. So yeah, so Toby's making the point that composing F and G, if it doesn't equal the identity, then you're gonna get something else every time you do it again. And it's, they're there, but they're not typically drawn. Okay, so let me yeah. see if anybody in the online community wants to ask another question. And I've got some more in the classroom if nobody there does as well. Okay, well, we're looking. Let's take another one from the classroom. I got one back here, and then I'll come over to you again. Yeah, so I'm used to using the word category to mean roughly like a set with some criteria for membership. But this, these seem more like representations or concepts in the way that I would usually talk. So I was interested in what you think of as the, like the relationship between this use of the word category and perhaps more everyday use of the word category, something more like a set. Yeah, the, I would think of this as like another one of those things where the mathematicians use a word that means exactly what they say it means. And I don't know, whatever the Alice in Wonderland quote is, you know, a word means only what I mean it to mean and not what I don't mean it to mean and nothing else. <laughs> so I've actually seen some people talk about categorial, they actually at, drop a letter because they try to distinguish the category. So instead of, you know, this is the categorical imperative, it's a categorical imperative or categorical reasoning. So it is definitely confusing. You know, there's a lot of people study category membership, like you say, and they think of the same thing. And it's also used in philosophy that people have a distinct usage of the term category historically. Um, I think in fact, the people who invented category theory thought they were being kind of clever. So they used the term, they were actually using Kant's sort of category as their, you know, their sort of intuition and the word functor shows up because Carnap used that in his philosophy and, but they don't mean quite the same thing. So think of it as its own thing. Okay, thanks. Jeff. Let me just apologize for math, math, mathematicians everywhere because we still work all the time. Yeah, so for the online people, Jeff has apologized for all mathematicians everywhere for confusing, <laughs> uh, using confusing terminology. Is that a two grand? Okay, all right. So we have one back question there. Yeah, do you have a conditional relationship, a conditional error? Can you be so like a conditional probability? Yeah, like I can't get like if you have A to B and then B to B, maybe I can't actually get them straight from A to B. I have to go to B first if I that makes sense. I can only get to B if I go to B. So it it makes sense in the 
physical thing that you're modeling, but you're going to have to have that arrow that connects A to D in your categorical representation. It may be that you're studying, you know, Manhattan distances. And so things have to exist and, you know, they can only, you can't have as the crow flies. You have to walk this block and then you have to walk that block. But you still are going to have an arrow that lets you get from here to there as the composition of these two. Um, is that... So you, I think I think we can add something. I think we can say like um, if you if you say to, to, if you say oh you know, I'm going to go from A to B and B to C. But if I if I if I want to go from A to C, then I have to go through B. All you're saying is that every arrow A to C factors through. We would say the arrow A to B. And so that just means that if you have any arrow, like you might call it you know, G from A to C then you could always write it as this thing from A to B first and then something else. So that, that's totally legitimate. So the B is implied if I just go from A to C. Yeah, that, that would come yeah. from- Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a rule you have in your category. Of your category. Yeah, it's a rule of your category. There's lots of ways you can enrich categories with additional structure as well. And we're still kind of at the beginning of our vocabulary tour, but certainly there's many ways to have more uh, have more elaborate categories or categories in which you impose additional expectations on what the members and the elements have. And so you'll see lots of adjective apply, adjectives applied to categories. This is a monoidal category. This is a symmetric monoidal category. You know, so there are, are labels for categories that would allow you to know that the things in them are expected to do or behave in certain ways or have certain expectations. Um, so not every category is like every other category. Um, all right, so I'm gonna take one more question and then I'm gonna see what I have left here that I wanted to try to get through before the break so that I can at least make an exposure of words that are gonna, I know are gonna come up further. So if, I, if I'm not being unfair, I know I've asked you a couple of times. So how about yellow shirt? Um, yeah, uh, hi, cool. Yeah, may, uh, my question was on these like annotations that the arrows have, like your path length or like which path did you actually take or something. Are there any restrictions on this uh, in the sense that, you know, if I'm mapping actually from the same things to the same things that at some point I have to say those two arrows are equal or can I just add arbitrarily many kind of additional information to my arrows? We need to know whether your arrows are the same or different, but I don't need to know anything more than that. And usually if you see multiple arrows connecting two different nodes, the understanding is that those are distinct arrows in some way. And the distinctiveness depends on your, your category or your example or the way you're thinking about it. But, but yes, if they're the same, you don't give multiple, you don't depict them multiple times. And if they're different, they're different. You don't have to annotate them. It's not obligatory that you annotate them with different letters or numbers or things like that. Okay, um, did we get anything from the online community that people wanted to, that are pressing need to know about? Okay, all right. So I guess slide again. All right, so where where okay, so this is the associativity is more important than identity, but it didn't make my I couldn't think of a good CAI uh, mnemonic, so I stuck with CIA. So I, but associativity is a is definitely a more critical component of sort of how you're building the arrows in your category. So here I've got these three objects, W, actually, I guess I've got four objects, W, X, Y, and Z, but I have three arrows, F, G, and H. And so, since I've said arrows compose, you can see if I first went from W to X and then X to Y, I would be composing G after F, which is in the lower left corner there. Or, since arrows must compose, I could first think of myself as going as composing the G and the H, which is what I've drawn in the lower right, and putting that after the F. So I have two different orders that I can do these compositions. And so uh, the question is, and so um, which of these is the right way to do it?
Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. right. So one of the things that's going to make it nice is those things have to be equal. If they're not equal, then you don't have a category. Not that, I mean, you can think of things in matrix multiplication or computer graphics, something that many of you may have known that where the order of operations really matters. You don't end up with the same thing depending on the order that you do the operations. But if you've got a category, that order of composition doesn't matter. And so if I can pose G and F first or H and G first, the three of them, the composition of all three of those is gonna be the same. So many times people don't put the parentheses in there. The F, G, H, F, G, H, F, G, H composition that we were alluding to before is just gonna be the same. So you just write it as a string of letters. Yes. Right. I mean, I mean, like whether I did the parentheses on the right, right associate or left associate sort of thing. That's what, that's what I, that's what I meant. So I'm, yeah, I may have not used order of operations quite precisely there. I just meant the order of which, where I put those parentheses, which two I sort of think of myself as doing first. And that may not be the order that they're sort of written in terms of the domain and the, and the codomain thing. Talk of, if you propose after G, usually you can't propose that order. Yeah, so the point that was being made by Jeff for those online is that um, in some cases, if things are really going in the way I've driven them here, as, uh, drawn them here as an example, you can't actually flip the arrows and think of yourselves running backwards. So it's it's really about the order in which you bracket, not the order in which you can um, um, apply these arrows to your objects. Okay. All right. So then if I didn't uh, gloss over too quickly, I think we've got the identity involved. And so I mentioned this traps of thinking everything is functions and sets, but I think with all the good examples we've had, there's less risk of that. So your category of choices, let's see, we've got about 10 minutes till our break max, and we've got some more questions. So let's skip that. And we talked about this example. Um, so this is my sort of reminder mnemonic, sort of like, you know, when you walk out, you're like, what were all those things that I was supposed to think about? So first you should meditate, you know, um, so now you have to come up with your objects and your morphisms. This is where I couldn't figure out how to use arrow terminology. And then you should get a little paranoid about whether you're actually right or not. And so that's when you have to make sure you've got your compositions, your identity, and your associativity taken care of. So this is this idea that you have to understand whether you've drawn all the arrows. And I guess it's been, yeah, maybe it hasn't been implied enough. What you're free to decide what the composition operator means in your setting. Um, I think it was easy given all these graph examples that I've been using for everybody to just think of addition as the composition operator. Um, or maybe because in math, you know, you think of composing functions, somehow it seems that there's a natural and only one way to do it. But it doesn't have to be that way um, at all. You are free to pick the composition operator as long as you verify that it follows this rule that, that associates and that your identities make sense. And that this, um, so using this natural number example that's come up a couple of times where I have one object and all of my arrows are numbers, I have to come up with a way to compose those arrows. So maybe I use addition as my idea of composition. So one, the one arrow and the two arrow when composed becomes three. Or maybe I use multiplication. So now if I compose the two and the three arrow, I get six, not five. And then you can think like, well, what if I do subtraction? Does that work? Or if I do division, will that work? Can I create a, mono a monoidal category from those natural numbers with any of the common arithmetic operators? And if you think about division right away, you realize, well, that's not possible because three divided by four is not a natural number. So I'm not going to get another arrow because there is no arrow that's three divided by four. So I can't compose I can't use division as the composition operator. So this is another place where you're really free to use your intuition, your ingenuity, the uniqueness of your setting 
it's like, well, now I'm thinking about these things. What is it? What does it really mean to compose this arrow and that arrow? How do I want to um, to view that? And does it really give me back another arrow in my category? This is something that I've used as a sort of the simplest illustration I could think of because I think this is one of the big ideas for me that I see as having a lot of potential for us in cognitive science, which is this notion of a functor. So I have a category on the left, which I've drawn this example of the simplest category, which is a discrete, well, I guess it's not the simplest. You can have a no object category, which has no arrows, right? Because there doesn't even need an identity. So that's probably, I guess there anything simpler than the no object, no arrow category, okay. So this is a simple category, three things, three identity arrows. This is some other category over here, but imagine all sorts of complexity if you want in the thing on the left and all sorts of complexity in the thing you want on the right. You give me a rule that maps the objects from my first category to my second category. You give me a rule that maps the arrows from my first category to my second category and which respects the structure, which I'll show up thing in a minute. And that's called a functor. Now think of us all thinking about like, oh, we have some model of mind or we have some model of reasoning or mental representation, but the guy down the hall in the bigger, better funded building is doing fMRI and he has a model of the brain and neuronal firing. How do we connect his model and our model? Well, if your model is the one on the right at the level of mental representation, and his model is the one on the left in terms of spikes and firing rates. If you can figure out the right category for his neural spikes, are they spike trains? And how do those spike trains connect to each other? Can I make a category of the neural algebra? And you have your category on the right of reasoning under uncertainty and what are my objects and what are my arrows? And you can then, now you have a common framework for you to be able to say, let's come up and test and see whether we have a sensible way of connecting our neural architecture to our mental cognitive architecture. Can we map the objects to the objects, the arrows to the arrows that respect the structure? Now we can span domains in a way that may give us some insight and some understanding or really test whether our mental category fits the physiological data or is what the physiologist is doing even capable of capturing the richness that we have in our cognitive account. So respecting the structure doesn't mean anything deep, just means that when I'm in the new second category, the identities are the identities and the compositions still kind of obey the compositions they're supposed to obey. So you'll often see functors represented in big letters, like here I'm using X for my functor, going from some category A to B. So if I use my functor on object B, the dog, I get some new object in this category. It may have its own name, but right now I'm just representing it as the thing I get when I apply functor F to object D. And so down at the bottom, we know we can compose G and F, but if I map G and F into my new category, I need to compose them over there as well. So, I have to be able to, I had arrows connecting things here. They are going to have to sort of obey whatever rules that I thought made sense on the left. If I can do that, I have a functor. So the other term, which I'm not going to talk about other than to show you the name so that I can leave a few last minutes for questions before the coffee break session, is this idea of, um, so my slides are available online and you can ask me about them if you want to, if they don't make sense, when you look at them later. Oh, I guess I should highlight equality doesn't always mean equal sign equality in the category world. They're often very interested in these ideas of isomorphism and equivalence, which many people deceptively distinguish by one small horizontal line. Yep. Thank you. Just yell more and more, just yell. Okay, so this is this idea of a natural transformation. So if you Things are going fast. You're like, oh, well, now we've got functors, but you can turn, you can connect functors to functors. And that's the idea of a natural transformation. You're going to hear more about it. I know Steve is bringing it up. So 
it's like the sort of the old joke about it's turtles all the way down. You know, it's categories all the way up. You can take your simple structures. They have objects and arrows. You can turn those objects and arrows into categories. You can take a category and another category and connect them with a functor. So now you can imagine that you have a category in which the objects are categories and the arrows are functors. But now we can actually also connect our functors by natural transformations. So we could imagine a category in which the objects were functors and the arrows were natural transformations. So you can just keep sort of marching up the whole, the whole ladder as much as you want. And you'll see this again in a more nice latex -y version, which is this sort of natural transformation square, which we have one functor going on the top, taken A to B, and it's connecting arrow. And we've grabbed A to B out of our category and we've connected them with a new functor G. And we need to have these vertical red function, these red arrows that are gonna sort of make sure that everything connects in a way that is sort of, again, respecting this structure. You'll hear Steve talk a lot about structure, structure, structure. So this is this idea that categories, as you grow them and complexify them, they still retain or must respect the structures of the things they're working with and inheriting from. And you can grow very rich. Um, the richness grows and allows you to do things like think about systematicity, think about differentiation and machine learning, think about active inference. So from those humble seeds of the vocabulary we've been talking about, you can get to the point of reasoning about these very complex domains. Um, but it does, there's a lot of stuff in the middle which is what you're going to get a glimpse of shortly. And so we've got three minutes to the break. So I'll just keep taking questions in the room and online until 1030 or somebody stops asking me stuff. But for anybody else who needs a coffee break, just sort of feel free to get up and move out. And the next talk will start at 1030. Assuming I don't lose my voice between now and then. Okay, question from the back. No, not necessarily. It depends on, they're just, if there's multiple mm -hmm. arrows between A and B, they're different arrows. How they're different is up to you. Maybe, again, I'm using this graph for intuition. Maybe we have two ways for me getting from my hotel to the coffee shop, but one of them is like really hard. So they're the same distance, but in one of them, I'm walking through muddy ground. So I use more energetic expenditures or something. So they might be the same in distance, but they're gonna be different in energy. So in some way, they're gonna to have to be distinct entities or they're not gonna be different arrows. But you, when you're constructing your category, you get to decide what makes sense. So Toby also talked about forgetful and free. You could imagine that, yes, in a sort of the forgetful version, these two arrows are gonna collapse into one because they're, their differences, their distinctiveness is lost. I'm going to sort of forget that part of the structure. But yeah, so, so now why I'm going to like... Because if I go down to the block, several nights, there's a lot different in terms of energy. That's not an idea. That's not, so that's not the intuition for the identity arrow. The identity arrow for the graph notion one is that you don't go anywhere at all. You just stay in the same place. So if you stay in the same place, a lot, you still haven't gone anywhere as if you just stay in the same place for a little bit. So if you did walk around the block, if we're using distance, that wouldn't be the identity arrow. That would be the time it took you to walk around the block. And so, yes, if you walked around the block and you composed those and we used addition, you'd have a big number. But just the, the intuition for the identity arrow is zero, not going anywhere, not moving. <clears throat> yeah. Can I ask a, it's David, by the way, can I ask a related uh, follow-up? I, I think uh, you've said at some point that the composition has to exist, and if it returns you to the same spot, that, that has to exist, but I'm not quite clear whether that composition in that instance where it returns you to the same spot does or does not have to be equivalent to the identity, which also has to exist. I'm understanding it does not have to be the same. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So if I said it, I was just wrong. Um, or just misspoke. I, what I was really using as my example 
was when I was talking about this, this idea of how you define the identity based on its effects on other arrows. And if we substituted IDX for the F in that top equation on the right, IDX composed with IDX, well, we used IDX for the F. So IDX twice is just gonna be IDX once. So that's what I meant about sort of the uh, composition of identity sort of going away or collapsing. But as was pointed out, it's not correct to just view compositions of non-identity arrows as going away. Yes. Yes, please. I have a question about this phrase, preserve structure. Okay. About functors. It seems you defined in a very minimal way. I want to make sure it is that. So would it count? Is it a valid construction if you map any category whatsoever to a single category that, I mean, to a category that has only one object and only one arrow and every object from the first maps onto this one thing and every arrow maps to this one arrow. Yeah. It's still the case that anything has a image and composition is defined. Everything is defined. It's just trivial. Is that still preserving the structure ah, in the sense that okay. all the structure that existed is now trivialized. Yes. So the, the question is, um, or it's not so much a question, it's a statement. The statement is that you can make a functor that obeys the rules I've described that takes, if we imagine that our second category is a one object category that has only the identity arrow, I map every object from the first category into the single object of the second category and every arrow from the first category into the single arrow of the second category. And if you work it out, you'll find that it obeys all the rules. And so, yes, it preserves the structure of the category in the sense of comp composition and so forth. But no, it doesn't preserve what you may find interesting. And so it may indeed be a very, as you say, a very trivial functor. And so, I, so I'll, I'll ask for my, in a second here, I'll yeah, ask for my all... host to sort of chime in, but I would say that there is, this is part of the idea of the choice of like, what, what is the interesting way to construct my category? What are the interesting functors that will give me insight into what I'm trying to understand better or show the things that I think might be different are different or the things that I think might be same are in some meaningful way the same. But it's also possible, yeah, to construct a lot of trivial things that obey the rules that just are not worth exploring. Do you want to correct or amplify on this, Jeff? Yeah, you can so, so for those online, Jeff was answering uh, the point by saying that there is a notion of the faithful functor, which is a little bit like the idea of injectivity, where sort of things that are distinct on the beginning end up distinct on the end. And you also have full functors, which say that you are going to a little bit like surjectivity, so that your stuff on the beginning is going to make sure that everything on the end is uh, hit at least once. So there are notions. So then you can have full and faithful, which is a little bit like a bijective function, sort of gives you a lot of the richness and you know it. So there are ways to put constraints on the functorial yeah. mappings that allow you to have a better sense of preserving the stuff you think is interesting. There is yeah, can a... I add to that? Please, Toby. Uh, I, I was gonna, I was gonna add something and then I, I, Enrique, I think I was, yeah, I, I also was gonna point out we have a, a hand raised in, on Zoom. Um, but yeah, the, the thing I wanted to add is just like, um, just just like these notions are full of faithful. I mean, when it, there are lots and lots of ways of kind of constraining the functors to kind of preserve properties you might be interested in. Um, so one of the things we might see later is like, you might have categories where you have not just like this kind of sequential composition, but you might be able to sort of put, you know, 
arrows in parallel as well. So you get a kind of, sort of parallel composition. And then you might want to ask that your functors you care about, like preserve that structure as well. Um, and so, you know, the, just the functor on its own, the only structure it has to preserve is the structure of being a category. There are all these other kind of richer notions of function, functor, which preserve all this other kind of structure. And they kind of, you know, those all compose too. So you get categories of like, of, you know, of monoidal functors, which means functors that preserve this kind of like parallel thing as well. Um, but yeah, I also would say we've got, you know, we've got a hand up here. Okay, so the online hand, you wanna unmute and start asking? Yeah, um, thank you. So very interesting uh, workshop so far. Um, and I kind of want to go back to a comment that you made, and I'm not sure if I'm going to say it exactly correct, but it was related to this idea of functor and how category theory uh, might apply to cognitive science. Specifically, we have different models and you might want to compare and understand how the two are different or something like this. And you made the, the statement that goes something along the lines of this, right? If you can identify the categories that are present in both models, then you might be able to identify mappings and be able to make comparisons. Um, although I think that's really nice and a great aim, um, I think it's really hard to do, and I'm not exactly sure by what means you'd be able to identify all the different categories that might be, you know, you know, implicitly or explicitly like made in a model. You know, I work in cognitive architecture. I work on uh, on Icarus. Uh, there's SOAR. There's other kinds of architectures like Actar, so on and so forth. And even understanding and making good comparisons between these kinds of models, which are relatively simple, uh, is hard. And I can imagine more complex, more physiologically based, maybe more neural uh, models would be potentially even harder to identify what those categories are, or let alone how to design or define these functors that go from one category uh, to the other. So. Um, Maybe in the examples of the demonstrations, there'll be some good clarifying, you know, ideas about that. Um, but I just kind of wanted to get ahead of the, the race a little bit and kind of ask that question and kind of secondly follow up by asking, does all of this mean that we have to use Haskell? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like is it, at the end of the day, is this tutorial going to end with, okay, this is why we should use Haskell? <laughs> <laughs> so or do we have alternatives? Yeah, I kind of gave up on Haskell myself, but uh, I like the language, but I'm not using Haskell. But it uh, it was my gateway. Um, so no, I think there sort of a lot of. So if your language has uh, computer language has types, you've probably got the rudiments of the category theory built into it, anyways. But uh, I wouldn't. So you may or may not want to use Haskell, but uh, there are certainly uh, Julia also has a library called computational algebra that's supposed to make explicit categorical structure so you can try to reason and do things in your code using the ideas of categories and sort of figure things out. And your other thing is that it's hard is uh, not an argument and I did not mean to trivialize the activity, but I know I'm guessing you've had conversations with others where you're like well. What do you mean you're, you know, what, how does your architecture do this? Or what, what do you, you know, it's hard sometimes to even find the common language in which to sort of exchange ideas to begin to puzzle out the differences and disagreements. So if you started with a more fixed vocabulary, well, let's see if we can think about like, so what are the objects and the arrows in the way you're sort of structuring things or abstractly, what do you think you're, you're an object in this larger space of what sorts of structures and things, you know, you're in the space, the category of vector spaces. It's really, you've just picked one vector space out of all the rest. And so if I've done it too, then there must be some linear transformation, at least in principle between us. And so do we think that really is a big difference or not a big difference? And so by using common parlance, maybe we would better advance on the road of overcoming some of those hard questions, but I don't think this in any way makes them easy or trivial or automatically solved. And I think the examples coming up will give you a better sense of how people are trying to do it and what the limits are so far and what the modest accomplishment, they're real accomplishments, but they're not answering the kinds of things you're talking about. Mm -hmm. 
Salvatore. Maybe this is too early to talk about this, but your question for the whole panel. So you mentioned uh, at least in the first blush, category theory seems to be the big argument of the graph theory. It's also reminiscent of the state of metal law and in general sort of mathematical systems that talk about relational structures. I wonder if you could comment a little bit on sort of, sort of what category theory might be particularly good for, such that graph theory or moral law are just not kind of language. So I, I used graph theory as an example because I felt it was something that was concrete that we could all um, sort of maybe have an anchor point with a frame of reference for sort of trying to build on these new ideas into something that we already knew. Um, I don't, so I think if graph theory does what you want, then you should just use graph theory, you know, and, uh, but you can treat the logics very well from a categorical perspective. And so in which case is modal logic may become an instance of a larger set of things and you can start to see it as belonging. And so if everything you wanna do is within confines of modal logic and modal logic is working and it's solving all your problems for you, then no, I don't think you should sort of uproot yourself and go feel like now I have to treat it categorically. But if you're doing something in modal logic and somebody else is doing something in, in a different logic and you're trying to like, how do I connect these things or where are they different, where are they the same? Are we really using different vocabularies to sort of fundamentally describe the same things that are happening at some deeper level? Or then maybe a language like this might give you a better opportunity to make those branch points. Um, and I'll let all the other presenters sort of amplify on what they feel are the proper or maybe the most fruitful mm -hmm. domains, the low hanging fruit within cognitive science. Um, yeah, sure, yes. I'm thinking about the picture and see category theory as a mathematical system for talking about relational structures, or is that, is that a bit of an illusion of the notation of the metaphor? Yeah, I think uh, both Jeff and Steve haven't had as much input. I'll let Jeff take it in the classroom, and then I'll ask Steve if he wants to expand on it. Salvador is asking whether sort of thinking of category theory as being particularly apt for things that have relational structures is a good spot for sort of deploying the categorical approach. So, Jeff? So Jeff was emphasizing that if the relations are something you view as compositional relations, then graph theory, excuse me, category theory is particularly apt for making that explicit and giving you a, a, a technical uh, basis for handling those compositions in a way that's yeah, not just verbal, but is mathematical. And then Steve, did you want to add anything to this idea of whether sort of where the, the best opportunities lie for sort of this idea of relations and category theory and cognitive science? Um, yeah. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> well, possibly the itself the relationship between, say, associative and, and relational systems is one opportunity. Um, or, and, uh, <clears throat> well, in my, in my case, uh, I'm, I'm interested in what's called a relational schema induction. The category is a nice way to address that kind of issue. Um, in fact, in, in my slides, I sort of allude to this point about um, uh, some of the category constructions are very analogous to some, some of the kinds of uh, constructions that you use in analogy theory in cognitive science, for example. So the short answer is yes, I, I think uh, category three definitely does. Well, so you've, we've got about 10 minutes for you before you're going to have to start your next talks. So I'll, uh, I guess I won't put you on so you can have a brief refresher. So maybe for also for the people in the room here, we'll just give everybody, and so I'll be around. I'm not going anywhere, so people can ask me more questions later. But we'll take a break, and we'll resume at 10.30 for the next set of talks before lunch from Steve Phillips. <laughs>